obeisances unto the Lord's feet of my Diksha and Shiksha Guru, Niti Lila Prabhishtam, Vishnu Pada, Sarasata Sisi Manshila, A.C. Bhakti Vinanta Swami Prabhupada. And I would like to offer my humble obeisances unto the Lord's feet of my Shiksha and Sanyas Guru, Niti Lila Prabhishtam, Vishnu Pada, Sarasata Sisi Manshila, Bhakti Vinanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. I want to offer my humble obeisances unto the lotus feet of my Shiksha Gurus, Srila Gorgo and the Maharaj, and Srila Bhakti Vigyan Bharti Goswami Maharaj. And I want to offer my humble obeisances unto the lotus feet of the Sri Rupa the Guru Varga, Srila Bhakti Vigyan Kesha Goswami Maharaj, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Goswami Thakur, Srila Bhakti Vinam Thakur, Srila Vishwanath Chakrata Thakur, and all of the great Acharyas in our Guru Varga line. And I want to offer my most humble obeisances at the feet of all the Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis who are present here today and in Bhai Trinami, Swami Maharaj, and all of the other Brahmacharis and Yasis, etc. So um, I'm going to be giving seven classes on Bhagavad Gita. We're going to be discussing things about the Bhagavad Gita that will help you to understand the book and how to study it. There are how, how it is structured, the key and important verses, the systems for learning it, some of the key commentaries and things of that nature. We're going to start off talking about the appearance of the Bhagavad Gita and uh, from there we're going to discuss uh, uh, other aspects of it today, uh, including uh, a perspective of it from Western philosophical and theological concepts. So, appearance of Bhagavad Gita. Gita Jayanti is celebrated on the 11th day of Margashirsha month, also known as Moksha Akadasi or Margashirsha Akadasi. The war, Kurukshetra War, started on the first day, or Pratipat, of Magashirsha right after Amavasya in the month of Kartik. But the Gita was actually spoken on that first day of the war. However, it did not appear to the world until the 11th day. And here's the explanation why. When the news of Bhishma Dev's fall, Bhishma Dev was shot on that Akadasi. On Magashirsha Akadasi, he was injured by uh, Arjuna and he fell to the battlefield and when, Bish, when, when Dhritarashtra heard that Bhishma Dev had fallen then in a worried state he calls for Sanjaya to explain what has happened on the battlefield so this is on the 11th day of Magashir Shurakita Jayanti so this is when Dhritarashtra calls Sanjaya to explain the Gita this is in uh, Mahabharata Sanjaya, with divine vision given to him by Srila Vyasadeva, narrates the entire battle, including the Gita, being spoken by Krishna in flashback. So, Dhritarashtra, he asks in Sanskrit, what did they do, Sanjaya? What did they do? This is, in other words, post. What happened? What, what has already happened that it's come to this point that Bhishma is now Lying, dying on the battlefield. How is that? So therefore, it's a flashback. So therefore, we can understand that Gita Jayanti on the Kadasi is when it was revealed, and that's why it's called the birth of the Gita. But it was actually spoken on Pratipada, the first day after Amavasya, Amavasya on uh, uh, Kartik, uh, the day yes. after Kartik, when, on the first day of Makashirsha. So here's some points by Srila Prabhupada about the commentaries of the Gita, the importance of them. The Bhagavad Gita is a standard literature. Most of you know this Bhagavad Gita. But generally, the Bhagavad Gita is read very superficially, not very critically. We do not understand Krishna, the author of Bhagavad Gita. Neither do we understand what is Krishna consciousness, although it is stated in the Bhagavad Gita. We read Bhagavad Gita superficially not very critically. Neither there is any addition so far, of course, 
In Sanskrit, there are many editions. Annotations by Sridhar Swami, Srila Baladev Vijabhushan, Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, Sri Ramanujacharya. There are many great scholars, but we have no information of those scholars in the Western countries. It's a lecture on Bhagavad Gita uh, in July of 66. Everything is there in the Bhagavad Gita. Everything is explained and commented on by so many great stalwart commentators, especially Sridhar Swami, Ramanujacharya, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, Baladev, Vijayabhushan, etc. So many great scholars have commented upon the Bhagavad Gita. So, try to understand Bhagavad Gita as it is. That is the real necessity of life. That we have explained several times. This is February of 74. Lecture by Shil Prabhupada. Now here are pictures of some of the great personalities whose commentaries we'll touch upon throughout the course of the seven-day seminar. Sri Ramanujacharya, Sri uh, Madhvacharya, Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, Srila Bhavadeva Jibhushan, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Srila Sridhar Maharaj. When he's talking about Sridhar Swami, Prabhupada is not talking about the Sridhar Swami, he's talking about the original commentator on Bhagavad Gita, Nikita, uh, from the Vishnu Swami sect. But we will also be discussing Srila Sridhar Swami's commentary on Bhagavad Gita. Um, there is a beautiful article in the Harmonist by uh, Srila Bhakti Keshav Goswami Maharaj about Bhagavad Gita. We will be touching on some of his comments and points about the Gita. Srila Prabhupada and of course Srila Bhakti Vinanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Bhagavad Gita as it is by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vinanta Swami Prabhupada. To Balad, Srila Baladev Vidyabhushan, who presented so nicely the Govinda Bhashya commentary of the Danta philosophy. This is in the beginning of Srila Prabhupada's Gita. And it is uh, a uh, recognition by Srila Prabhupada of Srila Baladev Vidyabhushan and the fact that he's largely following his commentary in his own commentary of the Gita. He's largely following Baladev and so now the question comes, why? Why is Prabhupada basing his commentary largely on the commentary of Mount David Jibushan? And we're going to show you why. First, we ask the question, why did Baladev Vijabhushan consider it even necessary for him to write a commentary on Bhagavad Gita? <coughs> when Vishwanath, shortly before that, his own Shiksha Guru, Shri Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur had written an excellent and original commentary perfectly in harmony with Gaudiya philosophy. His personal answer to that question, of course, we'll never know. He never was asked a question and he never gave an answer to it. However, by examining the commentary of the Gita Bhushana, the reader will be able to appreciate that he has indeed made a significant contribution to the study of the Gita in writing it. Like Srila Vishwanath Chakravati's uh, explanations, Baladev Vijayabhushan's commentary, his explanations, are unique and consistent with the whole of the Gita. And yet his commentary is quite different from Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur's. At the same time, the explanations are in harmony with Gaudiya philosophy. Thus, we have two equally brilliant commentaries on the same text. Both conclude, conclude the supremacy of Krishna and pure bhakti, but with different explanations of the verses leading to that conclusion. Within one sampradaya, we have two differing explanations of a work, both of which we accept as correct. Inconceivably, the two commentaries are different, but harmonious. In Srila Baladeva Jibhushan's commentary, we will find the influence of both Ramanujacharya in particular verses and Madhvacharya in the general philosophy. This was important to Prabhupada. This was important to Prabhupada because Prabhupada, his whole, his, 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 his mantra, okay, Mir Vishesha Shunyavadi, he came, Paschatya, to the West, to destroy Nirvishesh and Shudyavadi Kachat. He came for that purpose. And. Can you define those in some Nir, okay. Nirvishesha means 
uh, impersonalism, and Shunyavad means voidism. These are two different concepts. Nirvishesha dealing with uh, uh, Adi Shankara's conception of impersonalism, of Brahman, uh, of Advaita, that there, everything is one, there's only one. And voidism is, uh, Shunyavad has got to do with Buddhist conceptions of philosophy, uh, which are dealing with uh, the idea which is uh, very similar to Vaisheshika, one of the six darshans. There are six darshans uh, of uh, philosophy according to uh, Vedic thought. And Vaisheshika philosophy is very similar to Sankhya philosophy, but Vaisheshika says that everything is reduced to atoms which are <coughs> nothing or void. So uh, therefore, uh, these two conceptions, uh, the atomic conception of voidism by Sheshika or Shunyavad, which is in, in, embraced in Buddhist philosophy, and Nirvishesh or Dvaita uh, Vad, which comes from uh, the uh, misinterpretation or twisting of the Buddhist philosophy by Lord Shiva and his incarnation as Shankaracharya, uh, where everything is one, uh, so Brahman. Uh, these two things, uh, Prabhupada came to defeat these two things, and so therefore, Madhvacharya's general philosophy being the theme of Balde Vidyabhushan's commentaries, and who is Madhvacharya? Ashankaracharya uh, is Dvaita, uh, uh, Advaita, and Madhvacharya is Dvaita. Shankaracharya is saying one, Madhva is saying no, two. Everything is two. And he emphasizes that there's two. And he explains how there's two. And so we're going to discuss that a little bit. In Sri Baladev Vidyabhushan's refutation of impersonal interpretations of the Gita, he takes some of the arguments from Sri Ravanujachari's commentary on the Gita. Again, this is Prabhupada's mission to argue against the impersonal interpretations that are given by Adi Shankara. Sri Baladev takes the concept of vishesh, the power by which particulars in here exist essentially or permanently in an object from Madhvacharya in order to explain the non-difference of God from his qualities. Madhvacharya is a direct disciple of Sri Vyasadeva. This is important because Mahaprabhu's line is in directly in line from Madhva and Vyas in the Madhva uh, Brahma Sampradaya. According to Madhva, there are primarily two tattvas or categories of reality. One is Svatantra tattva, independent reality, reality, and Asvatantra tattva, or dependent reality. Ishwara, as cause of the universe, is the independent reality. And the created universe is the dependent reality. Madhva further enumerates the difference between the dependent and the independent reality as the five-fold division between Ishwara, Jiva, and matter. One between matter and matter. There's subtle matter and gross matter, matter and matter. Between matter and Jiva, there's Jad, matter, and then there is Jiva. The, uh, minute part and parcel of the Supreme Being, Sri Krishna. Uh, then between matter and Ishwara, then between Jiva and Jiva, and then between Jiva and Ishwara. So here you see that there's five different conceptions that Madhva presents of the difference between all of these things, and this is what Srila Prabhupada wanted to emphasize in his Gita. There's we, throughout his Gita, we see these themes. There's gross matter and there's subtle matter. There's matter and there's the jiva. There's matter and there's Ishwar. There's one jiva and another jiva. There's jiva and there's Ishwar. He makes differences. Prabhupada emphasizes the differences. And that's why this commentary was so important to him, because of Madhva's overall conceptions of the fivefold differences. According to Madhva, the inherent quality of everything is eternal. 
and this difference is neither temporary nor merely practical. It is an invariable in everything, for such is the law of nature. One is not two, two is not one. There is no object like another. This is what Prabhupada wanted to emphasize. This, the, the simultaneous separateness and individuality of everything in order to defeat the impersonal philosophy. Madhva's inherent differences. The created universe consists of jiva and matter. Jiva is a sentient, matter is non-sentient. Ishwara is infinite, jivas are infinitesimal. It is these eternal inherent differences that Srila Prabhupada highlights in the purports of his Bhagavad Gita. Hence, his basing his Gita on Srila Bhagavad Gita commentary. Om Purnam Adaha Purnam Vidam. There is no jiva like another. No man's nature is like that of another. Underlying everything and every individual person, there is unique individuality or speciality. The sea is full. The tank is full. Water pots may be full of water, but that fullness is not identical in all of these. The volume varies according to the variation in size. Everything is full and each fullness is different. In fact, even in liberated jivas, the difference prevails such that the degree of knowledge and enjoyment of bliss of each individual soul varies. So these differences, these individualities, the separateness, this is what Prabhupada wanted to emphasize in order to defeat Nirvishesh and Sunyavad conceptions. Hence, Srila Prabhupada has laid emphasis to the commentary of Srila Vildavadeva Vijibhushan because of the emphasis on the difference of the jiva from matter and Ishwara and the supremacy of Ishwara over the jiva and the qualitative oneness, ones uh, of Ishwara with everyone and everything. Nirvishay Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarani. Srila Prabhupada came to the West to destroy the impersonalist and voidist conceptions and Srila Vildavadeva commentary assisted him in fulfilling that mission. Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur. Now, Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur commentary established that the Gita was relevant to Gaudiya Vaishnavism as given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu through the teachings of Srila Bhagavad Swami. And this was very important because Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur's mission was to reestablish Rupa Goswami's teachings. So when you see his Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu and uh, all of the other works that he wrote were all condensed versions of the overall teachings of Sri Rupa Goswami and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's conceptions of the Manjari Bhav and the whole principle of the Dhrira Ras. The Gita was not considered in general by many Vaishnavas, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, to have real relevance to Rupa Goswami's teachings. Therefore, Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur wanted to emphasize that relevance. He wanted to show how it was relevant. And he's the first one who gives some inkling or indication of the presence of Madhurya Ras in Bhagavad Gita. And so his commentary is very, very important because it establishes the relevance of Gaudiya Vaishnavism to Mahaprabhu's teachings through Rupa Goswami. And this is why Sri Gurudev, when he makes this commentary, he translates the commentary of Sri Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur and uses the commentary of Bhakti Vinod Thakur as a base for his own commentary, which shows definitively these two commentaries show definitively what stages of bhakti are being discussed in the various verses of the Gita. When we read Prabhupada's purports in the Gita, if you make any kind of surrender, any kind of renunciation, any kind of uh, letting go of your attachment to material nature on any level, whether it's in karma yoga or kyani yoga or any point, this is Krishna consciousness. This is Krishna consciousness. This is Krishna consciousness. This is he unifies the whole thing. 
it's true, it's all Krishna consciousness, but what stage of Krishna consciousness is it? What are the details? Srila Prabhupada knew that he couldn't confuse the general readers of the West with great in details, in-depth details of the different stages, the minute stages of bhakti, from Aropsita bhakti and Sangasita bhakti and this and that and karma mishra and jnana mishra and so many things. It would have been way too confusing for the new people of the West to read a Bhagavad Gita with such minutia of detail in the different stages of bhakti. So he uniformly made it all, it's all bhakti. Yes, this is Krishna consciousness. Yes, this is Krishna consciousness. Yes. If you're making a sacrifice, if you're giving something up, if you're sacrificing your knowledge, your work, whatever it is that you're sacrificing, you're doing it for Krishna, it's Krishna consciousness. Yes, but what stage, what detail, that's given by Srila Vishnu Chakravata Therefore, Gurudev, many, many years later, I, I, I really don't like taking questions. It's not a question. I'm wondering if the translation can be separate from the people that are not listening to the translation. I don't know uh, where I can... Where can she on, the, on the side? Are those people listening to the translation? Maybe she could... No, she's making a comment. She's making it on tape so that people can hear it later. Right, but it's just that if you're sitting right beside the people that aren't too close to you. Can you sit Thank you. Somebody, somebody should move. Somebody. Come sit over here on this. You should put the chair yeah, right here, and you could be. Sit over here, by the way. Very easy. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So, you know, Shield Problem left in '77. Gurudev started preaching in '97, '96. 20 years later, it was time. It was time for us to get the details. It was time for us to understand more details about the Bhagavad Gita. And so, I remember when Gurudev's Gita first came out, I really was, you know, I had been going to visit Gurudev when he came to America, but I really wasn't part of his organization until January of 2003. And so even I was wondering, what was the necessity of another Gita? <laughs> we had Prabhupada's Gita. But in fact, as much as Srila Baladeva Vijabhushan's Gita was very unique and different and, and important to the Gaudiya Vaishnava world, even though Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur had just written the commentary, Srila Gurudev's commentary was absolutely essential, very, very important to the Vaishnava world. We needed that commentary. We needed an English translation a Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur's commentary and Srila Bhakti Manoh Thakur's commentary. We needed those definitive explanations of the different levels of bhakti and how they fit into the different chapters of the Bhagavad Gita and were attributed to the different verses. We needed that information and Srila Gurudev provided it for us. Hence, his commentary, very, very essential, very, very important. Arjuna, playing the role of the conditioned soul, inquires the tr from, about the truth from Sri Krishna. And in the purport to chap second chapter, 54th verse, Sri Gurudev delineates the 16 questions asked by Arjuna in the 18 chapters of the Gita. This is another key piece of explaining the overall understanding of the Gita understanding these 16 questions and Gurudev brings them up as he goes along throughout the Gita. So it's important to read the second chapter, 54th verse, and to see what these 16 questions are. It goes throughout the whole 18 chapters of Gita, up to the 18 chapters of the 18th chapter of Gita. Arjuna is asking questions. There are 16 of them. And they are the key questions on which the entire explanation of the Bhagavad Gita by Krishna pivots. And so understanding these questions will help us to understand the answers. As we remember from the Bhagavatam where Sukadeva Goswami says, the question is so wonderful <laughs> that it enlightens us what to speak of the answer. And so similarly, Arjuna's 16 questions are very important. And we're going to talk about why they're so important. Of course, of who Arjuna is. Okay. So, uh, 
this gives us a deeper insight into the overall spiritual progression uh, of Arjuna, which should mirror our own. Uh, there are other things that Gurudev gives in his commentary. I'm going to talk about them as well later on. Srila Bhakti Prajan Keshav Maharaj, in one article he wrote, shows us how Madhurya Ras and all other Rasas in the mood of Bhava Yukta Atmani Vedana is elucidated in the Gita, calling upon the commentaries of both Srila Baladev and Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur. Srila Bhakti Prajan Keshav Maharaj first establishes in his article that the speaker of the Gita is Sham Sundar of Braj. And this is a very important thing. This comes from the Gita Mahatmya. Sarvo Pani Shado Galo, Dugda Go Pavanandana, Parto Vatsa Sudir Bhokta, Dugdam Gitam Ritam Baha. The Upanishads are like a cow. And this Gita Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita, which is the essence of all the Upanishads, is just like nectarine milk from that cow. Lord Krishna, who is renowned as a cowherd boy, is milking the cow, and Arjuna is just like a calf. Learned scholars and pure devotees drink the nectarine milk of Bhagavad Gita. So this is a very important concept. Okay? In one of Sri Gurudev's books, I think it's the, uh, it's, you know, one of the books that they put out, which are a series of his lectures, and they put it together in a book, and I can't remember one it is. He specifically talks about this point where he says when Krishna is saying to surrender to him, he's not talking about surrendering to Vishnu or Narayan or even to Dwarkadish or Mathuresh. He's saying to surrender to him, Sham Sundar, of Brajendranandan Sham. That's what he's saying to surrender to. So, a Gaudiya sannyasi from another Sangha questioned me one time. Isn't it Dwarkadish that went to Kurukshetra to speak the Gita? How is he saying that Shamasundar is speaking the Gita? Then who's speaking the Gita? Is it Dwarkadish or Shamasundar? He was questioning me. To be honest, at the time I didn't know the answer. So I went and I asked Gurudev. Thank God he was here, I could ask him and get the answer. So he explained it to me. He said, in the spiritual world, Prajendra Nandan Sham is always in the Loka. Maturish is in Matura, and Dwarkadish is in Dwarka. He said, but when they're here in Bonlila, they're all together in one form for different reasons. For instance, in Vrindavan, we see, first of all, from the birth, the appearance, okay, the forearm form of Mathura Shadwarkadish appears to Devaki and Vasudeva and Mathura. Simultaneously, Prajendra Sham comes from the womb of Mother Yasoda in Vrindavan. Then Jiva Goswami explains how there's some mystic tunnel by which when Devaki asks the forearm form of Maturash to appear as her little baby, then Brajendra Sham goes through the mystic tunnel and he appears there with Maturash Dwarkadish inside of him. Now why are Maturash and Dwarkadish inside of Sham? For important reasons. When Vasudev brings Krishna back to Vrindavan and places him on the bed with Nandiya Soda and then takes uh, Yogamaya back to Matura. So in the future, when the demons come, to kill the inhabitants of Braj. Sham doesn't kill demons. In Goloka, there's no demons. There's rumors. They hear it. <laughs> demons are coming, you know, and they're afraid. But there's actually no demons there. So how 
will the demons be killed if Shab is just a lover? He doesn't kill them. Prabhupada actually talks about this in one purport where he says it's Vishnu within Krishna or Maturish within Krishna. And Gurudev said, this is how Maturish and Maturish and Dwarkadi, they kill the demons. When the demons come, they're killed by them. Sham is not killing them. Another important thing is the story that we've all heard from Gurudev in the Rathiatra book, uh, The Origins of Rathiatra, how the queens of Dwarka ask Rohini that how is it, who, who is Krishna talking about? When he's sleeping in our bed at night, he's calling out, Radhe Radhe, Gopi Gopi, Yasoda Ma, Nanda Baba. Who is he called? Who are these people? So who is that? Is that Dwargadish calling for Radha? No. It's Shama Sundar within Dwar. In other words, they're inseparable. The three of them, Gurudev said, the three of them simultaneously exist in every dawn. And yet, Sham never leaves for <laughs> He said, this is a chintabay tabla, it's inconceivable, but this is how it works. He said, similarly, when Krishna is on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, and he says, Sarvadharma Panitya Jyadmami Kamsadam Braja, as he says in this one lecture in, in the book, he's telling them, the Arjuna, to surrender to him, ultimately, as Shamasundra. That's what we say. Not to Dwargadish, not to Maturish, not to Narayan, not to Vishnu, but to Shamsa. And the importance of that will be talked about when we talk about the 11th chapter of the Gita. And we talk about how, how this entire question is resolved and answered. Arjuna asks certain questions, Krishna gives certain answers, shows the universal form, everything is resolved in the 11th chapter preparing for the key chapter of the Gita, which is the 12th chapter that defines Bhakti Yoga. Then in conclusion of the article, Bhakti Pragyana Kesha Maharaj demonstrates how one will achieve his particular bhava or rasa by the mercy of Sri Krishna. The details of this will be discussed when we reach the 10th chapter of the Gita. Our gurus, these three commentaries very important to us as they have touched our lives personally. Srila Bhakti Daksha Sridhar Maharaj. Srila Sridhar Maharaj does not give an extensive commentary in his Bhagavad Gita. His most significant contribution to the Gita commentary is the revelation of Madhurya Ras in Paraki above during his commentary on the Chatur Shloki of the Gita in the 10th chapter. Not even Vishnu Chakravati Thakur goes into that depth. This is you know, something special which Srila Sridhar Maharaj gives us. Srila Sridhar Maharaj also provides an outstanding commentary on verses 930 Apichet Sudarachara and 931 Shripram Bhavati Dharma. In another place, Srila Sridhar Maharaj tells a story about Srila Bhakti Manotakur's explanation of these two verses, giving us yet another special insight into them. And we will examine both of these commentaries. Actually, Achyutananda, in his book about his time with Prabhupada, tells a story about how he went with Srila Prabhupada to see Srila Sridhar Maharaj. And at the time, Shil Sridharaj was working on his commentary of the Gita. And Shil Sridharaj had Shil Prabhupada stay in the room with him so the two of them could discuss the commentary of the Gita while all of their disciples were not in the room because it was very intimate. He wasn't ready to express it to everybody. So they talked for quite some time and then when he came down, Achyutananda asked Prabhupada, he said, so what did you talk about? 
Prabhupada said, oh, we were discussing some verses of Bhagavad Gita. So then Chutananda asked him, he said, can you tell us? Can you explain what he said? <laughs> Prabhupada said, if I tell you this, you will faint. <laughs> because at that time, we were not able to digest Kaparaki Abhav and Madhurya Ras and the Bhagavad Gita. It was beyond our capacity to digest such a deep topic. And so Prabhupada said, no, you will faint. You cannot understand this. Furthermore, besides studying Shri Shriya Shri Prabhupada, Shri and Raya Marsh commentaries on Bhagavad Gita 930, we will also examine five other commentaries on Bhagavad Gita 930. One by Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, one by Srila Sridhar Swami, one by Srila Bhavdeva Jibhushan, one by Bhaktivinoda, uh, no, uh, uh, I think it's Sanatana Goswami. There's uh, Jiva Goswami. I think there's five different. Uh, there's five. I just don't remember who the five are. But I don't do know was one of them. Yeah, but th that's discussed by Shula Sridhar Maharaj himself. Okay. Besides Bhakti Vinod Thakur's commentary and Prabhupada's and Guru Days. There's five more. <laughs> Krishna's Kaviraj also. Though. Yeah, there may, uh, maybe he is one of them. Anyway, very interesting commentaries. When you read these comments, when you see what they talk about in there, it's, it's earth-shattering, actually, how, how forgiving, how absolutely forgiving 930 really is for devotees. Okay. Shula Sridhar Maharaj and Shula Prabhupada are other Shiksha Gurus. Okay, Henotheism is the next thing that I wanted to discuss. What is the theme of Bhagavad Gita? Okay. What is the theme? What is being taught? There's a lot of questions that people ask that isn't Hinduism a polytheistic religion? Polytheistic religion. They believe that God has many forms. And Henotheism, which is a Greek Word, meaning there's there's one God, is a belief in and worship of a single God while accepting the existence or possible existence of other deities that may also be worshipped. And in fact, this is what the Gita is teaching. It's a gradual progression. And I'm going to show you the verses where Krishna talks about this. Now, the origin of the term henotheism was originally coined by Friedrich William Joseph von Schelling in 1775 to 1854 to depict early stages of monotheism. You have to remember that many of the European dynasties, the kings, were originally pagans that were polytheistic they believed in, in polytheistic conception of God. And even after they, you know, in the third century, when they made their, their pact with, uh, you know, uh, with the devil, <laughs> in which the Pope and, uh, uh, and the, the pagan kings met and discussed how to uh, work out a way in which they could all enter into the Roman Catholic religion. Still, the persistence of the worship of the different deities stuck within the, 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 the royal families for many, many generations after that. So, um, von Schelling was the first one to try and make a bridge between those people who still had some polytheistic conceptions within the royalty of Europe and the monotheistic conceptions of the Abrahamic religions, Judaism and uh, Christianity and even the Muslim religion, which was by now becoming a very strong force in the world, in the Middle East and in the world. Max Mueller's use of henotheism 
Uh, Max Mueller is a German philologist and orientalist, and he brought the term into wider usage. Mueller made the term central to his criticism of Western theological and religious exceptionalism relative to Eastern religions, focusing on a cultural dogma which held monotheism to be both fundamentally well-defined and inherently superior to differing conceptions of God. In other words, he was trying to show the Abrahamic religions that you can have a, a, a primarily monotheistic conception while still worshiping other deities. That that was not impossible. And so he used this word of henotheism or brought it into wider usage for the purpose of trying to work within academia and the intellectuals of society uh, to have a greater tolerance uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of polytheistic or apparently polytheistic conceptions, uh, which in fact were monotheistic conceptions, according to him. Uh, therefore, he invoked this word henotheism. We're going to show you why. Henotheism was coined to describe the theology of the Rig Vedic religion. The Rig Veda was the basis for Mac, Max Mueller's description of henotheism in the sense of a polytheistic tradition striving towards the formulation of the one, Akam. This is in the impersonalistic conception of the Vedas, where people believed that the divinity aimed at by the worship of the different cosmic principles was the one Brahman. From this mix of monism, monotheism, and naturalist polytheism, Mueller named the early Vedic religion henotheistic. A prime example of the monotheistic aspects of the late Rig Veda is the Nasadiya Sipta, a hymn describing creation. That one breathed by itself without breath. Other than it, there has been nothing. So this is the impersonalistic concept. They look at it from that impersonalistic view that there was the one Brahman, the one supreme Brahman energy. Hinduism later developed the concept of Brahman to accommodate this idea of the one, okay, which implies a transcendent and imminent reality. And different schools of thought interpret Brahman as either personal, impersonal, or transpersonal. With the rise of Shaivism and Vaishnavism during the first millennium of the Common Era, Hinduism became essentially monotheistic, with a virtual consensus that there is one supreme, absolute, and omnipresent divine entity. Shaivism, Vaishnavism, and Shaktism each regarded only one specific Indic deity, either Shiva, Vishnu, or Shakti, as the supreme being and principal object of worship, whereas all other divinities are considered merely sub-gods or manifestations of it. Smartism is also monistic, but does not single out one specific Indic deity, but a pentad of gods the Panchayatana, or the Panchopasana, as it is called, which includes Shiva, Vishnu, Surya, Devi, and Ganesh. These are the five deities that they worship until they reach a point where they understand Brahman. And then they worship the Brahman and give up the worship of the personal form. This is a, an inherently uh, impersonalistic conception that's promoted by Adi Shankara and the Shankaracharya school. Now, henotheism in the Bhagavad Gita. Here is some verses which point to it. Those whose minds are distorted by material desires surrender unto demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. I am in everyone's heart as a super soul. As soon as one desires to worship the demigods, I make his faith steady so that he can devote himself to some particular deity. Why is Krishna in the Gita? This is the eighth chapter, verse 20 and 21. Seventh. Huh? Seventh. 
Seven? I'm sorry. Seven chapter. I apologize. Seven chapter, 20 and 21. Why is he insisting that, why is he making this point about uh, these deities? Why is he making this point that if they want to worship the demigods, I make their faith steady so they can devote them to deity? Why would Krishna do that? the end of the Gita, he's, he's telling everyone to surrender to him alone and no one else. Give up all other varieties of worship and surrender unto me. But here, he's saying if they worship a demigod, I'll make their faith steady. There's a reason for it. Because it's understood that it's a very long path. Later on, you'll see that verse is there. Vasudeva sarva miti sabahatma sadhur bahunam janmanam ante bahunam yananam mambapadya. After many, 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 many births, they come to this understanding. It's not that they understand this immediately. So what is Krishna trying to get them to understand? He's trying to get them to understand because impersonalism and voidism is very egocentric. It's very egocentric. It's very about you, the individual. You know, that I am, and I'm the one, and I'm one with God, and I am God. God is me, and I am God. It's very egocentric. It's very independent. It's very, I can do, I can make it happen, I can become more than, better than, I am, I'm the one. By my power, I will accomplish them. So, what Krishna is trying to do is get people out of that self-centered conception of life. That conception that I am God and that I'm the doer and I'm the one who can make it happen. He wants to get them to become dependent on a greater power. And so when they go outside of themselves, okay, if I want this, the only way I can get it is by worshiping a power greater than me. Accepting something outside of themselves, something greater than themselves. And so in this case, Krishna says, when I see that they have a desire to worship a demigod, I make their faith steady so that he can devote himself to some sort of demigod as opposed to thinking that he is God and that he's the doer and that he's the creator and he can make things happen. Rather he depends, becomes dependent rather than independent. He accepts his, he makes some surrender and that's a beginning. That's a beginning because the demigod as Krishna says, endowed with such faith, he seeks favors of a particular demigod and obtains his desires. But in actuality, these benefits are bestowed by me alone. Man of small intelligence worship the demigods and their fruits are limited and temporary. Those who worship the demigods go to the planets of the demigods, but my devotees ultimately reach my supreme planet. So, here... Krishna makes this point that, in fact, they come to understand Him and worship Him as the Supreme Personality of the Godhead via the worship of the demigods. It's a gradual process, gradual process of elevating their consciousness. Bahunam Janmanam Ante, Jnanam Vasudevas, after many, many they come to this understanding that Vasudeva Saramiti, that I, Vasudeva, am the cause of all causes, the source of everyone and everything, that I'm the one who's to be surrendered to, no one else. So, therefore, Henotheism is a theme within the Bhagavad Gita. Of course, Krishna ultimately resolves this issue with Bhagavad Jamanavante and but he makes this concession in the seventh chapter and it's important to note that the seventh chapter is within the six chapters that are the core of the Gita and so and we'll explain that tomorrow that's part of tomorrow's discussion but that's one of you know it's one of the important very important chapters 
to understand the Bhagavad Gita. Henotheism and Bhakti Yoga. We worship Tulsi. We worship Govardhan. We worship Lord Shiva's Gopishwara Mahadev. We worship the gopis. But there is one single God that is worshipped. That is Krishna. However, we have other personalities that we worship in conjunction with our worship of Krishna, which actually even pleases Krishna more. <laughs> and we would worship him directly. <laughs> and so, henotheism is also a theme within bhakti yoga. It's a conception within bhakti. But technically, we are a henotheistic religious tradition which worships a single deity but has other deities which can and are will be worshipped for various reasons in order to support our worship of that one supreme single deity Krishna. So I brought this whole thing about analysis because sometimes devotees have a hard time. People ask them, well, don't you worship many gods in this part of Hinduism? Uh, oh no, we're a monotheistic religion. How are you a monotheistic religion? That becomes also confusing sometimes when people see that there's other worship. And Prabhupada used to try to streamline all this. I remember when Nectar and Devotion first came out, and so there was a description of worshiping the pimple tree and the Aswatthama tree and this tree and that tree and so many different things, you know. <laughs> this devotee wrote a letter to Prabhupada. Prabhupada says that we're supposed to worship this tree and that tree and the other tree and everything. And this and that. What should we do? How do we worship all these trees? <laughs> Prabhupada, again, you know, this is so typical of Prabhupada's synthesis of the entire conception. He said, simply worship Tulsi Devi. By worshiping Tulsi Devi, all your tree worship will be accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the problem just took everything and brought it to the single common denominator by which we could understand and make, you know, have access to. And that, that was the beauty of the problem. All right, so tomorrow we're going to start talking about the divisions of the Gita, how the Gita is structured, how we can understand and approach the study of the Gita. And now I'll open the floor for questions. Any questions that people want to ask? Yes. Minutes earlier, tomorrow. Maybe. Huh? Fifteen minutes earlier. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll be here earlier tomorrow. I'll set yeah. it up earlier. Tomorrow. Like four thirty or something. Uh, yeah, we, at four thirty, we should start between four thirty and four forty-five tomorrow. I think we started at five today. Yeah, because of the yeah, because of so many things. But, uh, I don't want to end too late, and I want to be able to answer your questions. Do you have any questions that you want to ask? Or should I go on talking some more for a little while? It's up to you. You tell me what you want. Yes? So the um, persons who uh, coined the word henotheism and used it, Max Mueller, were they using it in a, a way to uh, say that it's less useful than monotheism? No, no. The opposite. And Mueller, Friedrich von Wilhelm used it as a bridge between the royalty and the intellectuals of Europe who still had pagan and polytheistic conceptions and were trying to bridge the, 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 the relationship between their those old conceptions that were still part of the ancient royal families and the modern Abrahamic religions which were becoming more and more dominant. But was he monotheistic? Who? Person who coined the word. No, no, no. Okay. So in other words, he wasn't saying, as Christians would say, that, oh, Paul No, 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 no. It, it, the opposite. Yeah. Okay. When, when Mueller coined the word, it was sort of like, because, because of what he said, if you look at what I, I read, I, I wrote, and what I spoke here earlier, it's like Western uh, religious authorities were saying that monotheism was superior right. to the polytheistic religion. He was saying, you don't understand what's going on with their polytheism. Their polytheism is not what you think it is. It's something very different. They have a deity 
which they believe in as the supreme core source of everything. And these other minor deities may or may not be worshipped at all. But you shouldn't think that your monotheistic conception is superior. They also have a monotheistic, at the core, at the heart of what they believe, is monotheism. But it has other things, which are other deities, which are part of that. And in fact, those other deities played a very important role in early Vedic society to help control uh, the avarice of, 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 of uncontrolled commercial development and, and material development. There would be no question of a, a, a ancient Vedic society denuding an entire forest for commercial or financial gain. They would never do such a thing. Every tree that they cut down, they said prayers. I, when I first studied Ayurvedic medicine, the, the, the Ayurvedic doctor told me that here in India, when, when they plant the seeds, they chant mantras and prayers planting the seeds of the herbs and the, and the trees that they plant. When they cut and harvest them, they chant mantras, they take it, they harvest and cut them on certain astrological days when the uh, medicinal power of the, med of the herbs will be more prominent and more dominant, etc. Everything is done with great care and attention because they believe in the deity that is the lord of the forest. Or, or would, they would never pollute a river with toxic chemicals. They would never consider or conceive of such a thing as being remotely reasonable within their sight because they know that the river has a personality, that there is a deity that is the personality of the river, the Yamuna, or the Ganga, or some personality that she's present. And you wouldn't think of throwing sludge in her face by pouring it in the river. And this is a very key and important point of understanding uh, these, the, you know, how these deities interacted or, or how people worshipped them and, 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 uh, and held them in esteem and what role they played within the management and organization of ancient Vedic society and the culture of Vedic culture. Your other question? Yeah. I know the conception that uh, you can't approach the king until you get a permission from the prime minister. Isn't it the same? You can't approach Krishna unless you follow the Guru Parampara. You can enter Rasalila unless you get yeah. a Well, this is another, that's another theological theme that we're talking about. It really doesn't relate to this here. You can approach Krishna unless you get a permission of the devotees, isn't it? Technically, no. Technically, no. You use you know, ancient Vedic culture. Something I'm talking about two different. That's, that's like talking about apples and potatoes. It's like two different subjects. Okay. Um, so, it's 6 o'clock, and we wanted to end between 6 and 6.15 because there's some things that people have to do to get ready before they leave at 7. So, any more questions that anybody has? Yes? I understood also that the living entity is situated in different conditions. Some are influenced by the mode of goodness, passion or ignorance or yeah. the mixture. And they need to improve. And yeah. for this, the These things will be brought out later when we talk about the other chapter. I can't talk about everything at once. But I'm trying to make one point now about henotheism. So yes, that's part of it also. When we talk about the modes of material nature later on, We'll talk about how this fits in with that conception of the modes of material nature. And so, like I was saying before, Baonam, Jamanam, there are many, many births. And the living beings are graduating. They're graduating through the material nature. 
and they're graduating through the human cycle of life. They'll take many, many births in the human form, and they'll go through those births, and they'll make gradual progress from a lower, more animalistic stage or conception of material life in the human form to a more uh, sattvic, uh, purified stage or conception of life. And so yes, as Rajanath Prabhu was saying, that people who are in the mode, they may worship a deity for a particular purpose in order to graduate themselves to the next level of consciousness in the mode of passion, and then those in the mode of passion will worship to graduate themselves into the mode of goodness, and those in the mode of goodness will worship to graduate themselves into Shuddha Sattva. And the details of that I talk about later on when I talk about the modes of material nature in the Gita. But uh, this is another perspective that he brought up and it's an important one. Yes, Prabhu. Yeah. Um, I'm always thought that the speaker of Bhagavad Gita is Dvakadish Krishna. And you know, Dvakadish yeah, Krishna. That's not yeah. what... Okay, but um, you know, when you think about the picture made by Iskon, you know, this Krishna, he has a peacock feather on his head. <laughs> you know? And we, we thought also, not me alone, you know, there is a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, because this is uh, Shamasunda in Vraj. Yeah. 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 So now... Yeah, we also say another part of Sarki is uh, Rasamas. Well, there's a conversation where they ask Prabhupada. So Gurudev was very... I know, I know, I know. But there's a conversation where they directly ask the question. They say to Prabhupada, why have you called this deity Radha Partha Sarathi? This in the battle of Kurukshetra, where is Radharani? And Prabhupada says, when is Krishna not with Radharani? That was his answer. He says, Radha is always with Krishna. Krishna is never alone. That was his response. <laughs> there is always different. Even our acharyas have different angles. Exactly. And so it's different angles of vision. And so Gurudev had one angle of vision. Prabhupada had a different angle yeah. of vision. But that was Prabhupada's point. And if we take a look at it from the perspective that Srila Bhakti Pragyam Keshav Maharaj, who is his sannyas guru, is saying that it's Shamasundar, and even Gurudev is saying Shamasundar is the speaker of the Gita. Well, why is it impossible that, in some sense, Radha may be there? Who knows? <laughs> we can't understand that. It's beyond our conception. But well, well, like you said in the beginning, Srila Prabhupada had to bring some yes, conception true. of Krishna consciousness into the Western world. Yes, and so that was his answer at the time. When is Radha not with Krishna? Radha is always with Yes. Bhakti Balapati Maharaj, he once told me, um, Krishna met the Gopis in Kurukshetra many, many years before yes. speaking the Gita. So he comes to this place and Im intensely remembers this wonderful meeting. And he remembers how the Gopis were always um, putting the stones away of, of his path. And Krishna thought, Yeyatamam Prabhadyante, I want to give them back, but I cannot, I'm so far away. But out of thankfulness and remembrance to the Gopi, he thinks, at least I can put away all pebbles and hindrances in the lives of all jivas by speaking Gita. So this means his whole motivation. Here's a, another viewpoint. <laughs> 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 no, so every every acharya is going to bring something to the table. And that's the beauty. Inconceivable. <laughs> Simultaneous <laughs> one and different. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it happens like this. It happens like this. And there's not a question of wrong or right. No one, no one is wrong or right. Because each person has his unique individual relationship with Krishna and his unique individual mission in spreading the knowledge of Krishna. And so hence, the way they perceive it and the way they present it is going to be different from the way someone else does because they have a certain perspective. Yes? Um, so, Sanjaya is speaking to the Tarasthal 
about what's happening on the battlefield. Within those 11 days, in the whole Gita, is talking about this. Okay. The Gita is spoken on the first day, okay? Uh, calendar wise, Kartik ends, Amavasya, and then the first day, Pratipat. Pratipat means in Sanskrit day one of the month of Magashirsha. So the Battle of Kurukshetra started astrologically on that day. On that day, Krishna spoke Gita to Arjuna. On Ikadashi, the 11th day, 11 days later, Bhishma Dev fell. He was shot by Arjuna and fell on the battlefield. Now, Dhritarashtra and Sanjaya were staying near the battlefield somewhere. There were some tents where the kings who were not involved in the battle itself were staying. So he was staying near there. And so news came to him on the 11th day, on the Akadasi, that Bhishma has fallen. And Dhritarashtra always felt that because of Bhishma, they would be able to defeat the Pandavas, because Bhishma was the greatest warrior on the planet. But what happened when Bhishma falls, then Dhritarashtra became concerned. Maybe we won't win. So he called Sanjaya and he says, Sanjaya, what is it that they did? What did both sides do? What did my sons and the sons of Pandu do when they met each other on the battlefield? What happened? In other words, how did we come to this point where Bhishma is killed? And so when he speaks that, he speaks about the Bhagavad Gita. And when he speaks about the Bhagavad Gita, it's on the 11th day, the Akadasi. So although the Gita was actually spoken on Pratipad, it didn't manifest to the world until Akadashi. That's why they call that Akadashi Gita Jayanti, or the birth of the Gita. Because that's when it was delivered to the public via Sanjaya. You understand? No? Yeah, but within those 11 days, between the first day... And the 11th day, yeah. yeah. What is the question? I mean, it's not that important what happened, it's just the battle. Yeah, that was the battle. It's just the battle going on. The battle was going on. The whole time, yes. Okay? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, you had bottom? You had a question? No. Oh, okay. I thought you had it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.